Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday morning praise. Would you all stand with us and praise and worship God? Oh, good morning, everyone. Great to see you here today for worship. Isn't it great to just be able to come together as a body of believers, just put away the world and just come here and focus on our God and our Savior and just have that focus of worship time. He is worthy of our praise, and that's why we're here together, and I just, uh, I love it. Uh, We'll continue worship here, but I just wanted to share a few announcements from our bulletin. If you want to open this up and take a look at some of the inserts here, uh, we're kind of uh, turning the page and getting ready for summer here already. And uh, so that means VBS for the kids. So you'll see this insert in here. All the instructions you need and the times and how to register are all on here. Uh, I believe we're going to have this up and running online, but it's not quite there yet. So if you just want to contact Teresa Lindahl here in the meantime, uh, we'll get ready for that. Uh, I have to announce a congregational meeting. We do that as part of our uh, uh, rules that we announce it a couple weeks beforehand. So please make a point for our congregational meeting on May 22nd to come. We've got important things to vote on here, including uh, our leadership positions here, and all of that is listed on here, so you can take a look. But please come with us. 
Um, and then uh, our full calendar, uh, and the main thing here, looking ahead to the summer, is Memorial Day is the day that our services uh, go to one service, and that's a 10 o'clock service for the remainder of the summer, so mark your calendars for that. And uh, also wanted to mention this bridal shower invitation for all the ladies at the church. We're going to come together in support of uh, Ada LaChapelle, uh, Eli Harris, fiance. And so all the information is in there. Let's come and surround this young family and uh, launch them off into wedding bliss together here. Uh, <clears throat> and then finally, I just want to announce that uh, we're a small church. We do things together. We all help out. We even mow the lawn here together. We've got a sign-up sheet in the back out there. And, uh, you know, it's a volunteer opportunity. We've got all the gear. Come, enjoy some uh, sun on your skin, and uh, get the lawn mowed so we, we uh, bear that responsibility together. If, you, if you're interested, we'll help you out along the way, but uh, the sign-up sheet's in the back. And with that, let's continue our worship. Great. Well, if you would, please stand with us and uh, praise. We have some good praise songs for us today. As I always say, when you sing these words, think about what the songs, we pick them out so that we are able to reach before the throne of God and lift our hearts, our songs, our voices to him. So enjoy your time praising God. It's the only time we have this week where we can do this together. I'm sorry, I had forgot. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. She's always helping me out. Uh, all right, so the call to worship comes from Psalm 135. It's a good way to introduce us, so thank you. Uh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the name of the Lord. Praise him, O servants of the Lord. Got it, Paul? You who stand in the house of the Lord, that's us, in the courts of the house of our God, praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing praises to his name, for it is lovely. All right, now we can sing. <laughs>
Who else could make every king? 
who is your life appears you also will appear with him in glory father we thank you that we can have that relationship here and now that you have given us your word to guide us that you have given us your spirit to dwell within that you have given us each other in the body of christ father what joy there is in your presence Thank you that you are here and you are going to speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. Good morning. Glad that you are here. Just got to get some of my stuff out as I'm going to be sharing. Um, it is an honor to be able to share this pulpit with Nick and I'll be able to share with you this morning, we're going to be jumping all over the Bible, looking at a lot of different passages. You might want to just take your pen out and write down some of the, the passages as we go along. And um, before we get started, let's go to the throne of grace. Dear Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Your word is truth. And uh, Lord, it is alive and active. And oh Lord, it, it is so powerful. And I just pray that you would cause us to fall in love with your word. Lord, I just pray this morning that I would not get in the way of what you want to say to our hearts, that you would speak and not me. Father, I thank you. You are a holy God, and you're in control of all things, including this time we have together. In your mighty name, amen. Well, when I came to Christ when I was 15 years old, I got my very first Bible. Now, it wasn't this one, uh, but it was one like this. And I went home that night, and I started reading. They said, start reading in the book of John. And so I started reading in the book of John. I'd never really been to church much, but as I began to read, I was like a kid in a candy store. The words just jumped off the page and grabbed a hold of my heart, and I sat down with the book of John, and I, I mean, I don't like to read. I'm not a student, but I enjoyed reading the book of John. And then I went on from John right to Revelation. I was like, oh my, <laughs> it was like overwhelming, and how can these things be? It's been 30-some years since that first few nights I sat down with the book of John. God said it, therefore I believed it. And I was reading, and it was like, okay, this is the way it is. Boy, Lord, we've got a lot of work to do in my life. 
And you know what? 30 years later, after being part of countless services and I don't know how many Bible club meetings and seminars and Bible classes and being a part of discussions and arguments and, and hearing all the different contradictions and things that you can sift out in Scripture. And you know what? I'm still a kid in the candy store. I'm still learning. And every day, it's like those words just jump off the page. I haven't arrived. In fact, I just barely scratched the surface of this book. This book was written over a period of 1,600 years in three different languages and th on three different continents. Parts of this Bible that we call the Bible, God's Word, was written in, by prophets, by poets, by a doctor, by peasants, by kings, by philosophers, by fishermen, by tax collectors. Parts of the Bible were written in dungeons. Parts of it were written in palaces. Parts of it were written during peacetime and exile. And as diverse as this book is, all these different writers, there's one main theme in this Bible, God's Word. It's God's redemption of man. Man struggled with sin and God, how God was going to send His Son to set us free from that sin. The Old Testament points to the New Testament. They say 6% of Americans believe that there's absolute truth. We have that absolute truth right from the throne of grace. The Bible says in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, correcting, and training in righteousness. It's kind of like when you open up your Bible, you ever have those father and son talks with your dad? And your dad would sit down and, and just share wisdom with you or pour into your heart? That's what it's like when we open up God's word. This is God's message to us. And he's sitting down, putting his arm around us. Jeffrey, I want this to be a part of your life. Jeffrey, you need to learn this lesson. Jeffrey, you need to learn this lesson again. <laughs> but 6% of Americans believe that there's absolute truth. You know what's even more scary? And this is done by Barna Research, that only 9% of born-again Christian teenagers absolutely believe that there's absolute truth. Only 9% of born-again Christians believe, Christian teenagers believe in absolute truth. We take a trip in our ministry, we go up to Canada, and we take young boys into Canada, and we teach them how to put together a message and how to preach it, and each of the guys that come on the trip um, put together a message, and they preach it in front of all the guys, and then they get critiqued on how they can improve their message, and so the last day, the guys are all preaching their message, we're packing up camp, there's a mound of gear, and we throw a tarp over it, because it could probably rain, and so what we try to do is get on the road out of that boat launch about 7, 8 o'clock, or probably 6 o'clock, that night so we can make sure he gets subway before it closes because you ever seen a van full of hungry teenagers it's crazy and that's the only place left open in town and so it's kind of a mad dash we're loading stuff you know that afternoon we have a couple hours to fish we're trying to catch the right amount of walleyes to meet our limit right on the dot and, and so we're we're fishing and so guys are loading gear hauling gear guys are flaying fish and throwing things in bags and sealing it and marking them and, and all these things are going on, and then we're loading the vehicles. you got to load everything just right. And then we, we, we leave for Kukukas Lake in Ontario and start the long drive home. And, you know, things are getting thrown everywhere. And, and of course, usually it's raining, so everybody's covered for, with mud head to toe. And it's crazy. Well, what we do, we kind of finalize this trip, and we've gotten really good at what we're doing. And so we switch off drivers every two hours, and then every driver has a teenager that sits in the in the shotgun position, or, you know, the seat right next to it, and keeps the driver awake during the night. And so I drove the, the two-and-a-half-hour bumpy gravel road into Ignis, Ontario. Everybody got their food. Somebody else drove the next shift. Well, it's my turn to drive again, so I get in the, the driver's seat, and we're at Grand Portage, Minnesota, along the North Shore, Lake Superior, and all the guys are, you know, you know getting situated. And Taylor says, well, I'll ride shotgun. I said, that sounds great, Taylor. So Taylor Caspers gets into the, the seat, and I tell you, we no longer left the parking lot, and all will there's... <laughs> He's out cold! And so I'm driving, and I'm driving along, and you know what it is? It's, it's 2.30 in the morning, it's dark, you, you're tired, it's been a long day, and, and so you start getting the yawns, and you're driving along, it's like, I'll be sharp, i got you know these 10 or 12 kids, their lives are precious, they're in my hands, i got to be alert. And so I un undid my, we had a, a Bullville van, Chevy Bullville van. I opened up the glove compartment box. Unbeknownst to me, 
I have a fillet knife, and we've been filleting fish. And at that time, I didn't have, you know, something to put the knife in. Actually, Randy made this for me. So there was my fillet knife in where all my cassette tapes are. And so it's 2.30, it's dark, everybody can hear snoring everywhere in the van. And so I reach into that glove box, and I slide my hand in, and the, the knife starts at the top of my thumb, and it just goes all the way through, just like a hot knife through butter. I'm like, ah! And I pull my thumb out, and it's bleeding like crazy. Like, oh my goodness, what in the world? And I look, and there's my fillet knife in with all my cassette tapes. And I'm like, who would have put that in there? It wasn't me, but somebody decided, you know, not throw it in the back of the boat, but, you know, they put it in there so it'd be safe. Well, it wasn't safe for me. So here I am. Now it's 2.30 in the morning. I'm bleeding like a stuck hog, and there's blood everywhere. So I just grab a napkin and wrap my thumb and just keep driving, and that kept me awake for the next hour and a half. But in God's word, it says in Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. That's a one-sided fillet knife, but let me tell you, I start cutting, it's pretty sharp. And it says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. It's living and active. It's re- relevant to today. The everyday struggles we have. There's stuff about anxiety and anger and lies and self-esteem and selfishness. It's very relevant to today and it's active and it's alive. You can take Bible prophecy and look at Jesus' first coming when he came to die on the cross for our sins. Some 300 prophecies were fulfilled when Jesus came. And now we can sit there with our Bible open and listen to the news and say, oh my, get ready, Jesus is coming back soon. It's relevant, it's real, and it's active. It penetrates, it gets past the surface of you, it cuts to the heart, it divides soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and attitude of the heart. Think of some of these verses. Matthew 6, 20, some of these verses just cut. And when you, you, you read them, you hear in a message, or you read them in your quiet time, or they come back to memory, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Hmm. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Matthew 6, 27, Matthew 7, 3. Philippians 2, 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambi- ambition or vain conceit, but in humility... Consider others better than yourselves. And and Paul doesn't let up either. He goes on to verse 4. He says, each of you should not look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Philippians 2.14, do everything without arguing or complaining. Is this cut to the heart? Oh my, it's convicting. Ephesians 4.29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate with one another, forgiving each other as God forgave you. 2 Corinthians 10.5, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. So many verses. And these jump out and they cut right to the Right through the outside shell that we had to go right to the heart. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other. Think about that, bear a family of believers. We have to bear with each other sometimes. Sometimes in our own families, we have to bear with siblings or one another. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Proverbs 10.19 is a good one. When words are many, sin is not absent. But he who holds his tongue is wise. Matthew 5, 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its saltiness, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. John 13, 34 and 35. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It confronts, it cuts right to the heart. It cuts to the being of who we are. It causes us to examine 
ourselves. How are we doing in this? And it isn't just to read at it and look at it. Oh, that's nice. But do not merely listen to the Word. Do what it says. Look at your, like looking in a mirror and examine yourself. How am I doing in this area? It cuts right to the heart. I know why Jeremiah wrote that. Your Word is like a fire. It's like a hammer. It pounds the granite stone of our hearts. It's like a fire. It, it, lights, it just causes us to, all right, let's go, Lord. Let's go to work. My brother and I growing up, we ate a lot as teenagers, and uh, we had like five meals a day, and we drank a lot of milk. In fact, at one point, my dad said, you guys need to back off on the milk. We get done playing a game of basketball, we come in and drink, you know, like two or three glasses of milk, and, and the milk is so good. I love these messages where I get to, you know, enjoy up here, and, uh, but milk is so good, and I, I still love milk to this day. And, and we would sit and drink all this milk. And finally, Dad said, after two and a half gallons a day that we were going through at home between just my brother and I, he said, you guys need to back off on the milk. And, and, and if you just live on milk, um, in 1 Peter 2.2, 2, um, it says, Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. And there's a time to be on the milk and on the bottle and, 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 but you know what? You can't just live on milk alone. You can't just sit there and be on the bottle. You need to start moving on. And you imagine sitting here on a Sunday morning in the back row with your baby bottle out. What happens if you just live on milk? It's not enough. You need to get into the meat. And that's what it says in Hebrews chapter 5. It says, in fact, though by this time... You ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not equated with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use had trained themselves to distinguish good from bad. And so getting away from the, the elementary things, and you have to come back like tonight, today is this morning, it's like a reminder of some of those elementary truths to come back to the importance of God's Word daily in our lives. But there's times when your mouth waters for one of those Dan Josepho steaks. And some of the guys know what I'm talking about from these men's retreats. It's time to get into the meat, to get, a, get on from some of those elementary things about the importance of being in God's Word and how you should pray and, and uh, the assurance of salvation. But start digging in and, 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 and doing it for yourself. You see what I'm saying is don't let Stillwater Evangelical Free Church be the depth of your Christian walk. If you come once a week and you get fed here by Nick, that's not enough. Just think if you just ate once a week. How would you be doing? In fact, you probably wouldn't be doing. You wouldn't be here. Probably be in a hospital somewhere. But that's how we sometimes try to navigate our Christian wa our walks and our lives is hear a good message on Sunday morning. And Nick challenges us. But it, it, it's kind of like a bird. You see a bird flying around, it's flying, and it's looking for, it's a robin. You see these robins, some of them are so fat they can barely fly. Some, like the one of them I see walking in our front yard, his belly was dragging on the front ground. I mean, he was big. And, and so you see him swap trying to fly away. But these birds, they, they collect worms and they have a nest and they, they eat these. They, they swallow it down and then they go flying to their nest. And all these little mouths go beep, beep, beep. And then the mother comes over and right into each of the little birds' mouths. And that's how they get fed. But that's what it's like on a Sunday morning. Nick takes the word of God, breaks it down into little pieces that we can understand. But if we sit there and we just listen. And sorry, Nick, you know, big mama bird. Okay, yes, okay. But, th <laughs> but that's the way it's like if we just sit there and take what he's digested and challenges us. We need to get home, go home and dig into the Word. And don't have just a one-sided relationship. You see, God spoke to us just like, you know, that father and son sitting down and him having a, uh, our dad having a good talk with us. Sometimes it's discipline, sometimes correction, sometimes it's encouragement, sometimes it's rebuke. But God speaks to us through his Holy Word, all these... These writers were inspired by God to write these messages to us for today. And you think about that. How do we talk to him? We talk to him in prayer. Now I say if there's anything weak in my life, it's my, my prayer life. But that's how that relationship is. We talk to him. Colossians 2, 6, and 7 says this. 
Uh, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Just as you received Him, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up. This last week, <laughs> I decided, uh, Jason Bacon borrowed me his bobcat last fall, and, and, and I was widening out my driveway because we put an addition on our house, and he said to me, you'll, you'll never take enough dirt, so always take more than you think you'll need to take. And so I, I moved a ton of dirt out of my front wall and, and the front part of my driveway, and out, I moved it all in the backyard and building a rock retaining wall and so on and so forth. So I moved my rock retaining wall. Well, sure enough, come this spring or this winter, trying to pull the car in and out of the driveway, when it goes about four feet out and then it slants like that, it takes like six turns just to try to get it into the garage. And so I, was like, I wish I had taken more dirt out. And so for the last five days, I've been into the wheelbarrow, and about 56, 57 wheelbarrows later, I've moved only part of my wall back, and, but I'm digging along, and I'm digging, and awesome, boom, boom, what did I hit? I'm thinking, okay, gas line, you know, rock, uh, electrical, no, there's none of that here. Well, it's a big old tree root. It was like I'm looking around, where is there a tree? Where did this thing come from? It's like 25 feet away is our tree, and here's this tree root all the way over to my driveway. But it says, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, digging in, getting rooted into the Word of God. You see, this relationship with the Lord, we're not done growing until we see Jesus face to face. It's not a sprint. A lot of times I work with teenagers, and they think it's a sprint, and then during the teen years, yeah, me and the Lord. And in college, it's not, yeah, me and the Lord anymore. It becomes, becomes a compromise. And sometimes even later in life, and tell you what, it's hard in ministry sometimes. My heart gets broken when I have poured years of my life into some of these teenagers and then see the choices they make when they leave. You see, it's a marathon. We're digging in. We're getting rooted. And we're growing. You've got to have your roots, and they have to go down deep. Psalm 119. I'll read some more verses for you. Verses 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure by living according to your word? I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. You ever have times when it's hard to pull out your Bible? Because you know that what you're doing, the choices you're making, the attitudes that you're holding on to, the the grudge that you're holding towards somebody, maybe the argument you have with your wife. We don't argue in our home. It's, it's called aggressive fellowship. But, <laughs> you know, when, the last thing you want to do when you know you're wrong is to get into the Word of God. You see, this book can help keep you from sin, but sin will also try to keep you from this book. And sometimes when we've, we've blown it or we're in the midst of a hard heart time, that's, that's the best time to get into the Word. Lord, soften my heart. I've hidden your Word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And later on, later in that psalm, I mean, it's a long psalm. <laughs> psalm 119, verse 105, Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. You want to know how to steer your life? Do you want to know what God's plan for you is, God's will for you is? It's right here. God's written it all right here in His Word. It's a map on how to live our lives, how to navigate this culture and this world, this country we live in, and the challenges that are there. Psalm 1-2 says, um, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. It's not just reading it. It's meditating on it. It's reflecting on it. Sometimes it means memorizing it. I found memorizing God's word is very helpful when you're in the midst of a spiritual battle. Jesus had to do it, and he had to quote scripture to fight off Satan's attack. How much more do I need that kind of help? Exodus 16, we have an interesting story. God has scooped up the Israelites and brought them 
out of Egypt. They were in slavery in Egypt. They paid a price. And God comes in with these ten plagues and basically decimates, just destroys Egypt. And he brings his people out with a mighty arm. And they're there by the Red Sea. And all of a sudden, God parts the Red Sea. And they go down. All million plus people march down through the Red Sea. And soon, they're at Mount Sinai. And they're, they get the Ten Commandments. And they wander in the desert. And they get to the Promised Land. And they're on the way to the Promised Land. And they begin to be hungry. It says the whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There at least we sat around with pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you brought us up out into this desert to starve us, this entire assembly, to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they'll follow my instruction. On the sixth day they are, prepared, are to prepare what they bring in. That is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. And so God is going to feed them by his mighty hand. And so they wake up the next morning, and there's a stuff that looks like bread. They didn't even know what to call it. They said this, whatchamacallit, or what is it food? You remember the whatchamacallit candy bar? That's why I said, Bobby, it was a whatchamacallit candy bar. That would have been a lot better to eat. They had all this bread. It was all over the ground. And they said, what is this stuff? I want to share some more milk. Oh, let's go get some milk. Excuse me. And so... You know, I should have had, like, donuts or something like that. <laughs> donuts are good. But there's all this bread all over the ground. And they're supposed to just gather enough for one day so they could eat it at home. And so what some, you see, the people would obey. No, there were some in there. They gathered, like, huge, oh, man, it's like you're being at the beach and you're finding all these really cool shells. You just grab, you only need, like, two, but you grab, like, 50. And so they're, like, filling up baskets and they bring it home. Next morning they wake up, it's all rotted. And they didn't listen very well. You know, it's the same thinking. You try to sail your Christian life or float your Christian life on yesterday's winds. Each day, getting that, well, bread for physical sustenance, but getting into God's word daily and getting spiritual depth and growth and sustenance. Digging in. Do we do this spiritually? You hear, I work with teenagers, so I hear from kids all the time, camp was so awesome, and then you come home, and it's like a week later they've lost that glow, and they're discouraged, and they're, why isn't like camp? Well, a lot of times if you're there together with a bunch of other Christian students, and you're having a whole week just with God, it's very powerful and very moving, and you hear testimonies, and God does incredible things in each other's lives. But if you try to just float your whole Christian walk in your life on that one week experience at camp without getting into the Word every day is like a camp experience. You camp in God's Word and it comes alive and it speaks to you. Reading through the Bible. Sometimes there's some challenging passages. I've, I've been reading through uh, Hosea and Jeremiah and there's some tough passages. Some tough times of ministry for, for these guys. You come here on Sunday morning it's like Don Roberts used to say, cake. This is the cake all week, getting into the cake. I, love, I don't know what it is about food, but cake all week. But you come Sunday morning, that's the frosting is what he would say, the best part of the cake. And that's what you get up front. It's like trying to play soccer without cleats. You have a soccer game, you're trying to play soccer without having cleats on. You're sliding all over the place. Guy's running with a soccer ball and he, he stops. To turn, you just go sliding right on by and he kicks it right to the goal. Trying to float your life without being in the Word of God daily is like that. Having no cleats in a soccer field. It's like driving your car with no oil. You don't put oil in it, what's going to happen? It's going to seize up. 
You're going to blow up your car. It's not going to run anymore. It's like going to school, never doing your homework or studying for a test. You're probably going to fail. Trying to live the Christian life without filling your life each day, you will slide, you will wreck, you will fail. They said the average teenager spends about 50 hours a week in front of a screen. A lot of times adults aren't too far away from that. I don't know how that happens, that we could have that much time. I think about my own time. I take this last week and evaluate how many minutes or maybe even hours I calculate up for the week's time that maybe I was on Facebook or checking the twin scores or seeing what the weather is going to be or, uh, you know, downstairs watching a TV show. And I added up all that time and I put it on a piece of paper and then I pull it out and it's okay, how much time did I spend with the Lord? I think probably since I accepted Christ when I was 15 years old, I, I guarantee you I've spent more time in front of a screen than I spent in the most important book in the entire world. We have a huge opportunity before us. There are kingdom opportunities all around us every day with our kids, with our neighbors, in the workplace, here at church. There are opportunities. We have opportunities to swing for the fences every time we get up to bat. They say Minnesota is one of the fifth least religious states in the entire nation. You look at the things going on in our country and the challenges that we have ahead in the days to come. I see things that are going on and it scares me. I hold my precious little grandson in my arms and I think, what kind of world or country are you going to grow up in? What might it cost you to stand for Christ? What do I need to be doing now so that you can stand for Christ? God uses young people. He uses all people. I think of, and I'm used to working with teenagers, but God uses young people. He uses teenagers like Mark, Jeremiah, even a teenage David went and picked a fight with a giant. And Charles Spurgeon, in the 1600s, a great preacher, pastors his first church at 15 years old. And I was trying to think, who do we have around here around 15 years old? I was thinking of Lucas, he's not here. He's a little bit older than that. But 15 years old, imagine having a 15-year-old pastor. Charles Spurgeon. And look how God used him to start a revival. His church grew to about five to 6,000 on a Sunday morning. In the late 1970s, 19, early 1980s, in the country of Romania, there was a dictator by the name of Nicolae Ceausescu. They called him the butcher because he persecuted Christians. And in fact, if you read much about the revolution that overthrew the Iron Curtain of Romania, it was done by the young people. And Nicolae Ceausescu tried to exterminate Christianity. He would have, in some of the church meetings, there'd be different people scattered throughout the church. In fact, they didn't meet in buildings like this. A lot of times it was warehouses, they find a warehouse where they can meet and a dirt floor, no heat. And they would just meet there to worship God together. There was a cost. Some of them walked up to 10 miles in the winter just to be there on a Sunday morning. You talk about commitment. It was a commitment to be at church. And sometimes there'd be secret agents sitting right in the congregation. And they would take note who was on stage. They would take a note, ooh, somebody shared a testimony, they accepted Christ. They would take note that somebody accepted Christ that morning. Sometimes those people would disappear. Sometimes they'd be looking for a new pastor. And that just didn't happen in Romania. It still happens around the world today. Thankfully, we have the freedoms today to continue to meet like this. But it isn't like that for many people around the world today. 
And it wasn't like that for Romania. One Sunday morning, they were meeting as a church service. And they were gathered in this little warehouse. And in, barges in the KGB. And all these officers came in with their machine guns and their guns. And they marched everybody outside. And one of the soldiers grabbed a picture off of, G- of Jesus off the wall. And he took it outside and he threw it in the dirt. And he threatened everybody in the church. He said, if you want to live today, come up here and spit on that picture of Jesus. Boy, you could just see the blood drain out of everybody's faces. What would you do? There's a long period of silence. And then finally somebody from the back comes forward. <laughs> and walks on. Sits on this side over here. And another one right behind him. <laughs> and then another one. And another one. And some of them justify, well, I want to live. I can live another day and make this right with the Lord. But one by one, people came up and they spit on that picture of Jesus. And they didn't. And they were going to be executed right there. And then this little girl comes up and sees a picture of Jesus. She gets down on her knees. She takes the picture and drops all the drool off of it, and she begins to take her hair and begins to wash that spittle off that picture of Jesus. Those Romanian guards, they looked at each other. They didn't know what to do. They'd never seen anything like this. And maybe they'd been doing this a lot. They were so stunned. They didn't know what to do. They decided to take all these people that had spit on that picture of Jesus and they locked them up and put them in prison. They said, if you can't be even that faithful to your Savior, how can we expect you to be faithful to our government? And they locked all those people up. And that's not always how the story turns out, but it turned out that way, that time, by a little girl who was sensitive to God's word. How about you? How are you doing in your walk with the Lord? You think about God's holy word that is spoken to us, God's love letter written just to you. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants you to grow with him. He wants you to grow strong with him and be rooted in his word so that you can make a difference. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word, your holy word, your love letter to us. Lord, speak to us about getting into it, not just once or twice a week, but daily, discipline ourselves, just like Daniel did. He ate three times a day physically, but he read, he read, spent time talking to you three times a day, reading your word and working on that relationship. I pray someday I can be like that, to be like a Daniel. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, thankfully, we don't have to go through that. They did, and we can freely read the Word of God when we want to. Would you stand with us? We're going to close out with an old song that Jeff requested that uh, reminds us of that Psalm 119, verse 105.
a good morning to be with God and to be together. And as I, um, as we leave here this morning and we enter into your week, may the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he reveal himself to you as you read from his word this morning. Go and be blessed.